There are typically three different kinds of sermons. There's the topical sermon in which a preacher picks a topic and then he goes to different passages in the Bible that reference that topic, whether it be greed or grace or salvation or punishment. Then there's the textual sermon where a preacher p picks a small passage of scripture, perhaps uh, five to ten verses, and he extrapolates on principles we can find in that passage. And then, of course, there's the more difficult, the uh, expository sermon where a, a preacher takes a particular passage and studies each word and the historical background and tries to communicate the exact same message that the writer and the Holy Spirit intended. So it's typically unwise for a preacher to preach an entire book of the Bible. But unfortunately, that's what we're going to do tonight. I was uh, reading Ecclesiastes uh, seven days ago, and I just love the book so much. And I realized I can't take it just one passage at a time. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to go through the entire book. We're basically going to hit the, the key themes and, and the, the main points. Uh, you see, if we were to take one passage of the book of Ecclesiastes by itself, you would think that Solomon is manically depressed. If we were to take a separate passage from Ecclesiastes and look at it all by itself, you would think that he was a hedonist in encouraging hedonism. If I was to take a separate passage by itself, you might think that Solomon is a nihilist, a, a person who feels there's no value or point in life. And in fact, these are many of the interpretations that commentators uh, see the book as. I think they're wrong, but that's typically how many commentators see this book. So let's try to understand the book in its entirety and the key message that Solomon is trying to communicate to us. I hear a lot of echo. Is this okay? I'm not bothering you? Okay, sounds good. All right, let's consider the context. The, the book was written roughly 1,000, excuse me, 3,000 years ago. Uh, it seems that Solomon wrote this at the end of his life, roughly uh, 940 to 930 B.C., uh, the main theme, or one of the main phrases you find, is vanity of vanities, or a common phrase, striving after the wind, uh, the idea that something is pointless or futile. And the main theme of the entire book is the vanity of life without God. The book chronicles the pursuits of Solomon and what he learned from them. Then one thing I really appreciate about this book is that it chronicles many of the failures of Solomon. And I think it takes a strong and wise individual to recount his mistakes so that others can benefit. If you will turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and we'll consider his first pursuit, which is wisdom. It says, I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. Now, we know Solomon had quite the advantage in pursuing wisdom. God had appeared to him in a dream. This was a very special thing. Now, we think uh, when we're reading the Old Testament that God appeared to people all the time. But he didn't. Maybe he would uh, appear to a select few individuals. And rarely would he have a back and forth conversation with someone like he did with Abraham or Moses. But God appears to Solomon in a dream and says that he is willing to give him whatever he wants. Now, I could think of a long list. I'm pretty sure you could too. Solomon could have had anything. He could have had the blood of his enemies or riches and wealth, but he asked for one thing, wisdom. He realizes that he wants to be a great king and he needs wisdom to do it. And God was so impressed with his request that he gave him that and much more. Now, we know from 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, he did a lot of writing. He recorded a lot of his wisdom. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and wrote 105 songs. Now, unfortunately, we don't have all that, but we do have a portion of his wisdom. 
His wisdom was so great that many powerful leaders would come to seek uh, to, to see what he would teach them. The Queen of Sheba comes to him in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, but she comes a little skeptical. It says that she came to test him with difficult questions. Now, perhaps you've met a person who who you heard a lot of things about, who, who was extremely intelligent, and you decided to see, well, how intelligent are they? So you ask them a few questions. Now, as you can imagine, I'm a guy who likes to ask a lot of questions, and I know the people here, you guys are always seeking knowledge and to understand the Bible better. And I'm sure you've ran into the same issue I have. You've never found a person who's been able to answer all of your questions. Gary does pretty well. Sometimes I ask some very obscure questions, and he comes up with some very, very good answers. But usually, I can't find a person who knows everything. But Solomon answered every one of her questions, and she was extremely impressed. Now, one would think that since Solomon has contributed to much of the wisdom literature we have in the Bible, he would say great things about wisdom. But he doesn't. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17, And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I realized that this also was striving after the wind. Have you ever tried to catch the wind? Have you ever stood outside on a windy day and, and stood downhill with a plastic bag or a jar hoping to catch the wind? No, probably not. It's an impossible task. Uh, one thing that might help it help uh, this concept or help us uh, understand this idea of striving after the wind is is a dog I had a long time ago. Uh, his name was Scooby, and no, I did not pick out the name. My, my mother did. We always regretted the name, but we we loved the dog. He was a big black uh, half lab, half Australian Shepherd, weighed about 105 pounds, and he was a handy dog too because every time a car would pull up, he would bark. And every time a car would come by, he would chase it. And that was his favorite thing to do. Every time he saw a car, he chased it all the way up the road. He got hit roughly nine times before one finally got him, but it was his favorite thing to do. It's something he did every single day. Do you think he had a plan of what he would do if he actually caught one? No, I don't think so. Do you think he, he planned out a strategy or, or had some great aim of actually catching a car? No. It was an impossible task, but it's something he did every day to no avail. This is how Solomon sees wisdom. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. He says, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. He says, what good is it that I have been wise? Is the mic still working? Yes, okay, sorry. I'm hearing different things, so I can't tell if it's working or not. I'm glad that it is. He says, one, of, one fate befalls us both. We die. I'm extremely intelligent. I'm extremely wise, and yet I die. Or the fool who's... Ex <laughs> or the fool who knows nothing, who has no purpose in life. He also dies. So what's the benefit? He says this too is vanity. And in verse 16 he says, We're all forgotten, no matter if we were wise or foolish. This too was striving after the wind. Futility. Vanity. So he does something different next. He pursues folly. Read with me uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, also I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. 
My wisdom, my wisdom too stood beside me. You see, most people in life, they start out with folly. Not everyone, but most people. They, they make some really dumb decisions and they realize they need to make a change. So they turn to a more wise, more calculated uh, uh, lifestyle where they, where they actually consider things. But Solomon, he starts out with wisdom and he's not satisfied, so he turns to folly. And if there was anyone ever able to truly pursue folly, it would be Solomon. He was the richest man in the world and the richest kingdom of the world, at least at that time. He could do anything he wanted, and that's what he tried to do. One of the first things he tried to do was to seek out wealth. We see in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, that his yearly income was 666 talents of gold. Now, that might be hard for us to wrap our minds around because uh, when I uh, was in uh, excuse me, Sunday Bible school as a kid, I thought of a talent as a, a little coin. For example, we all know the, the parable of the man with the five talents and the man who had two talents, the man who had one talent. And I thought this master came around and just gave these little coins to his servants. But a talent, or at least a Roman talent, was roughly 60 pounds of gold. Uh, some talents could be as many as 90 pounds. And Solomon had 666 for his yearly income. And still that might be a little bit hard for us to understand because I've never seen that much gold and I'm pretty sure you haven't either. Uh, Canada minted a giant golden coin. They called it the Big Leaf Maple. Big shock on the name, I know. But it was roughly 21 inches wide and a little bit more than an inch thick. And in 2017, it was rated as being roughly $4 million. And think about Solomon getting 666 of these every single year. Uh, they minted five of them. Uh, one was stolen, and it looks like they melted it for, obviously, it's gold. Uh, he also had a successful shipping company. We see that in 1 Kings 10, 11. And he also received many precious gifts from uh, foreign powers. Uh, still to this day, when a, a foreign power visits a, a, another king or president or prime minister, it is often accompanied by wealthy gifts. The queen of Sheba, when she visited, she gave him 120 talents of gold, precious stones and great spices. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27, that silver was as common in that day as stones. They had so much gold that silver was of little value. But this too for Solomon was vanity. He tried his hand at many great works. If you will turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 4 through 6. He says, I enlarged my works and I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, which I irrigated to a forest of growing trees. He did what many wealthy people do when they have a lot of extra money. They tried to build great things. Now, I think wealthy people in our day typically like to build like golf courses or, or hotels or, or uh, apartment complexes. Not the same thing, but that's what they do nowadays, which in and of itself is okay. But Solomon felt that this, too, was vanity. Not only did he try his hand at building great things, he tried his hand at pleasure. He had many male and female singers. This is far before Spotify or Pandora, so it's nice if you have people who can sing well who hang around. He also uh, enjoyed wine from his vineyards and, of course, women as well. We know from 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, a lot of these wives are probably uh, political marriages from the nobles in Jerusalem and the nobles from surrounding nations. And uh, a, a concubine, is, it, it's different depending on the context. In the context of the Hebrew Bible, at least right here, these are likely more mistresses, uh, except in a more acceptable sense, at least in that context. Uh, not that it was accepted by God, but the culture of the day. I know it's extremely unusual to us, but this is what Solomon did. 
And this is something that was actually forbade in the law of Moses. The king was not supposed to multiply wives to himself. So just because we see a a prominent biblical figure doing something doesn't make it right. And of course, many people who uh, are not following God's way, they they try to find fulfillment in some other way. Uh, I worked at Two Men in a Truck a long time ago. And when you work a manual labor job, it often attracts two kinds of men. One, men who are noble and hardworking and will be the best employees that you've ever hired. The other is men who are typically aimless, who have no real goal in life. I was working with uh, one of my friends uh, on a particular Saturday, and we were talking about how we would spend our weekend. And he said he was going to see about a woman. And I said, okay. The conversation continued, and his goal was to be with 100 women before he graduated from college. That is what his dad did, and so he thought it would be a good idea, too. It's a shame, don't you think? If only he had maybe read the book of Ecclesiastes, he would have seen where that would get him. So what did Solomon have to say about all of his pursuits? Read with me chapter 2, verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Thus I considered all my activities which had been done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. For Solomon, all of this was vanity, striving after the wind. Pursuing wealth is an endless cycle. There's always more money to make. There's always more products to move. There's always bigger houses to build. You accomplish one goal and then there's more to do. You, you can never truly be satisfied. The same is true of pleasure. You can be satisfied for a moment and then the craving continues. One cannot find fulfillment or happiness in that. Solomon concludes with the bitterness of life. He says in Ecclesiastes, when I say conclude, not the entire book. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. He says, So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who never existed who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. He says, it's better off that we were all dead. And better than the dead are the ones who never existed, the ones who never had to endure this life at all. So why does Solomon feel this way about his life? After all, he had everything he wanted, everything he could have asked for. Why was he so bitter? Because he lived it the wrong way. Many, not all, but many of the things he did were okay. They were okay. It was okay to build great houses. It was okay to have a lot of money. But he did it the wrong way. There's a key phrase that needs to be understood, and it's Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24, he says, For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without God? You see, wisdom in and of itself is not a bad thing, but he pursued it without God. Wealth in and of itself is not a bad thing, but he pursued it without God. Who can be happy without God? Who can find fulfillment in life without God? Solomon pursued wisdom simply for the sake of pursuing wisdom. Can you imagine going to school for for 10 years, getting a doctorate degree that you will never use? I think that's vanity. I think that's a waste of time and money. Imagine reading the entire cyclopedia and never going on Jeopardy. I think that's a waste of time. And I'm pretty sure you do too. Solomon said that the more he knew, the more miserable he was. He said it became a grievous task to him. And what about, excuse me, 
Solomon did love wisdom, though. though. He wrote many great works, such as Proverbs and this one. In fact, that's the reason he wrote the book, was to pass on what he knew. But his initial problem was is that he pursued wisdom for the sake of it, without God. And that's why he writes in Proverbs 9.10, when one pursue, pursues wisdom, their foundation has to be God. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when you start there, you find a wisdom that is worth having. And what about enjoying the pleasures of life? There are many things to enjoy in life, each in their own time and their own season. When it comes to working hard, Solomon says in uh, Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. And then, of course, enjoy the fruit of your labors. As he says in Ecclesiastes 9.7, he says, Go then eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. God has already approved your works. The problem was that he had was he was making the, the, the wisdom and the, the wealth the goal of his life, the end itself and not a means to an end. He, gathered, he built great things simply for the sake of building great things. He gathered wealth and money for the sake of having wealth and money. And he had many wives for the sake of having many wives. But we see he learned his lesson. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, notice what he says, and this is at the end of his life, he says, enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which has been given, you, which has been given to you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. This is a man who had a thousand wives, and at the end of his life, he says, love the one, life, the, the one wife, the one wife in which you have. After Solomon had achieved everything, he had became the wisest, richest, and most powerful man on earth. He felt it was vanity. Striving after the wind, he felt the life he had lived was pointless. It was futile. Because he knew at the end that he did it without God. We are to live life with and for God. And this is the only thing that provides any meaning in our life. Everything else in life, it fades, it corrupts, it corrodes over time. But living a life for God is eternal. Something that carries over into the next life. That's why Solomon concludes in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 Starting at verse 13, he says, This is the conclusion, when all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. I like how certain translations say, this is man's all. He says in verse 14, For God will bring every act into judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. This is the meaning of life. This is how we find meaning and, va and value in our lives, by living a life that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And if you have been living up, if you've been living your life to this point in a futile and vain way, we would love to baptize you. If you are here tonight and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you are willing to repent of your sins, and confess him as Lord, we would love to baptize you, and through that, Christ will add you to his church. And if there's anyone here tonight who has perhaps once been obedient to the gospel, but is no longer living in a manner that is pleasing to him, we would love to pray for you, and God will certainly forgive you. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.